Yeah, it's a great question, and I hear it a lot, which is do these techniques which have been honed in the world of software, particularly it feels like maybe consumer software or startup environments, are they even relevant in more of a tangible good environment, hardware environment, even medical environment, clean tech environment? Short answer is yes, and I've seen it applied. One of our startups uh, that we backed was a cancer diagnostics company. You know, over the life cycle, it raised 60 or 70 million dollars. And, uh, but the first thing that the founders did was use lean startup techniques to test whether the minimum viable product they anticipated they would build would work for a certain kind of doctor and for the certain practices. We did a case at HBS on this company and we did a case at HBS on a clean tech company that was building a very complex uh, uh, biofuels technology also using lean startup techniques and using them very religiously. And I gave you the case study that I referred to that Eric Ries uh, talked about with GE Power. So the prevalent experience across some really broad industries has been that these techniques, you got to form fit them obviously for the environment. You can't have a daily release of a nuclear power plant. <laughs> that would be not good. But you can think about applying lean techniques to nuclear power, power plant development. And in fact, there's an entrepreneur here in Boston. People know that e-ink, the electronic ink we all have in our Kindles, uh, or when we used to buy Kindles, um, was invented in Cambridge by this company, e-ink. The CEO of e-ink, Russ Wilcox, is now doing a nuclear power plant company because he figured electronic ink was too easy after 15 years of, of working at it. And so he's uh, developing a technology to build small uh, nuclear power plants. Nuclear power plants, one of the issues with power plant um, production, in addition to safety, is scale and expense and time. So he's trying to take lean techniques to build a, uh, the equivalent of a mini or PC-based power plant compared to the mainframe, and he's applying lean techniques to that as well. So the answer is in a really broad and diverse range of industries, yes, it can be applied. Great. Thank you. Does anybody, so the other thing that we do at Harvard Business School is when someone asks a question, the secret at HBS is that the professors actually don't answer the questions. <laughs> right? They orchestrate the audience to answer. So does anyone have a response to that where they've seen that in their environment and where it's worked? Yeah, yeah, right, tell them I said so. It's a good, see how long that gets you. you. We got a couple of case studies here, but here and then here. Shoot. I would say try to convince them to do an A-B test on that. You go the water for water. Give me a small budget. A small lean team. And I'll show you what I can produce. So that's a fun idea, which is use your organizational tools to actually test the idea of the organizational process. Hi, I'm Simon Lee from G Health Guard. You just mentioned G, so I just wanted to chip in too. I think one of the things that we've done at uh, G was showing by examples of certain failures that also happened. That kind of helps management teams change their thought. And of course, I think Jeff Immelt's a big proponent of Lean Startup as well, so that helps with uh, corporate sponsorship. Yeah. And actually, it's funny, you, know, you think about Jeff Immelt, CEO of GE, being a proponent of Lean Startup. And it's really, it's an extraordinary thing that general, you know, GE, the, one of the largest industrial companies in the world, if they're proponents of Lean Startup, then how, how is it possible that you, know, you can sort of look at your CEO and say, how, how come you don't get it? Like, how, you know, the other person, just if you want to think about this, is uh, Intuit Scott Cook, who I think is one of the really most brilliant thinkers about product management. You know what Scott Cook's technique was for customer requirements gathering when he launched Quicken? Follow me home. Follow me home, right. So what was the follow me home program? Yeah, so, uh, Scott had his product teams, his designers, and his product managers actually visit customers using his product uh, to see how they see how they entered their information from their text from their checkbooks and if they're printing or just different things in their own environment and yeah, it's a little uh, brought, creepy. All that knowledge, yeah. It was, right. So like you'd, you'd be shopping at the back then, you'd go to the retail store and pick up a back then shrink wrap box of software which has media inside of it that you would actually install. And you go to the cash register and somebody would tap you on the shoulder and say, excuse me, I'm an engineer at Intuit, the company that you just about that software. Can I go home with you? <laughs> and I hang out and look over your shoulder and see what you're doing and how you install it when you put it in and the prompts and how you react. And, and so it was the following home program. And he would send engineers and product managers out into the 
real world and the retail shelves out in the wild and follow people home. So I think Scott Cook is one of the most visionary thinkers about product management, product requirements, customer discovery, and he has totally embraced Lean. And Intuit's it's a big company now, and he has in, uh, had Lean technique and Lean production and, and this whole test and learn culture now permeate the entire environment. I think it's funny you ask that question because Rev1, I think, is the easiest of them all in some ways to use Lean techniques because in Rev1, you are tabula rasa. You can create something from scratch and you can put something in front of the customers and, you know, again, you put the minimum viable thing that you want to use to test a hypothesis. So one of my startups might have the hypothesis that um, freemium is going to be a powerful value proposition and that if they stay with a free entry level product, they can get strong adoption. And if they charge, then they're going to really cut off their initial adoption. So they can just test two different things. Now they may not even build the product. They may just test two pages and test the value proposition and say to people, click here to buy on one hand versus click here to sign up for free on the other hand and see what the conversion rates look like and have no product standing behind that web page. So you can test, again, it just depends on how you formulate your hypothesis. You can test an amazing number of things without sucking up engineering resources or at a minimum having those engineering resources just be prototyping as opposed to building. So Spotify is an example. They talk a lot about, I don't know if people are power users of Spotify. Um, in their paper, they talk a lot about how they've changed the web experience. <clears throat> so the initial uh, Spotify was very app-centric because they kind of grew up in the app-centric world and now they want to have a better web experience. And they, so for them it was like a 1.0 you know, web experience created from scratch and they wanted to really think about it. But they did the same thing. They threw a bunch of stuff in front of people and just got them to react to it. <laughs> I'm sorry, I would back that CEO. Um, I'm wondering what you would... Well, first I would say, I think, um, what I'll call continuous delivery, I'll use another phrase, which is dynamic content, is also very interesting. That is where the, the site reacts to the individual that comes in the door, just like when a store... This is an e-commerce example, but imagine this broadly. When you walk into the store, the clerk reacts to you differently than they react to someone else, depending on what you look like, what, you, what you're interested in, what you're asked for, male, female, what have you. And dynamic content is moving in that direction, which is dynamically reacting. And so you're not only going to have continuous delivery, but you're going to have continuous delivery with all these different test cells related to dynamic content. It's also very automated, sort of out of control. Totally automated, yeah. But, the, and this is why I wanted to give you this example, the marketing department needs to define the personas and needs to articulate what the focus should be for the persona. So if the persona is female, age 30 to 39, from the Midwest, interested in value, that's the marketing, and this is the content we should show that person, that's the marketing department's job. And from a continuous delivery standpoint, who's gonna decide what to test if you don't have product management? Engineering can instrument the site to test as iteratively and continuously as you want, but who articulates the strategy to define what tests you run. And this again goes back to my language of running experiments. Who's designing the experiment? And that's the job of product management. And that's why, I, it, like I said, this is a really, it's a big change. And these big changes take years to ripple through. But if you don't think of yourself in this fashion, you're at risk of having some smart ass CEO say, what do I need you for? All you do is write requirements documents and pretty interviews with customers. I need somebody who can really drive strategic impact, which means design the tests, articulate the hypotheses, command the resources, iterate from there. And lead, again, product management, it's all about leadership. Then go back to my CEO and tell him. Yeah, I mean, I... the snide answer is Google $300 billion market cap. Sure. Okay. Amazon $125 billion market cap. But but I, actually, but I don't, I don't know the, the, the more thoughtful answer, which I, I hope you don't sure, have to be sure. cute about it, but the more thoughtful answer I actually don't know. I don't know of any rigorous experiments that have been run. I do know that there are real world experiments that we see every day in the marketplace. And when you see what's happening in the marketplace, particularly in the fast growth innovation sector, and particularly in the startup and venture back sector, 
which is where I sit, it's it's sort of blindingly obvious. So um, let me let me ask a, a second. And but let's get back you pause to on, on that. Does anybody else know of? We got a lot of experienced smart people in the room. Does anybody else know of? So there's there's tests tests that compare different strategies, and the real benefit is probably not on the upside in terms of designing the product faster, because you still might arrive at the exact same product that you would design with the waterfall. Yes, that does come. The the benefit is on the downside. You fail much cheaper. Avoiding, uh, avoiding okay. expensive yeah. failures. It's not so, going to work. You save a lot of money by killing it faster, sooner, cheaper than designing it and then watching it. So more risk mitigation than anything else. Yes, and there's been a lot of studies on that. <clears throat> so I, I buy that. I would also argue that the upside is evidence in the marketplace. Okay. Because the faster you're iterating and the more you're meeting these customers, you can see you know, these things. I mean, look at the, the 47 companies that are the unicorns. That is the 47 companies that have created over a billion dollars of value in the last 10 years. So arguably a pretty robust sample set and a quite successful sample set. If you were to survey those 47 companies and ask them how many use Agile and Lean and how many of you use Waterfall, I would bet it's 47 to nothing. <laughs> I mean, it's like not even close. So let me just ask about the GE example you used with the five years or five one year sprints or whatever. In that case, over that five years, are they coming up with the same result at the end of the five year time? Better, they think. Better, okay. Better. It's a better product. Cool. You know, in the healthcare, are you, what do you find? I mean, healthcare is like super regulated, lives are lost if you screw things up, and it's GE. So it's got three strikes against it for being effective and lean. What are you finding? I think the. Uh, mic. Do a good filter on you. <laughs> um, I think what we've seen so far is for the software products, there's been more benefit that we could see in a shorter term versus our hardware, hardware products because it's harder to integrate those teams in traditional organizational structures into the new organizational structure. Yeah. But we are still struggling with some of the regulatory elements on being able to do certain yes. tasks in certain sequences because of the kind of things that are required in terms of paperwork or you know, right. other submissions. I'll tell you something about hardware though, <clears throat> and you know, we're entering into a new, really a golden era for hardware startups right now with all the, with the combination of uh, the consumer electronics industry being so disrupted and the shrinkage of microchips and software and importantly lean techniques. So lean manufacturing now being applied in the hardware world is spectacular. I mean, so whereas venture capitalists would never invest in hardware companies because they were afraid of expensive failures to this point here earlier, um, now people are prototyping so fast with such little money, VCs are investing again in hardware companies. And I'll leave you with one case study. There's a company called Lit Motors, which won the TechCrunch Disrupt Award uh, two years ago. I don't know if anybody's ever seen this company. It's the coolest video of a product ever. It's a combination of a scooter and a car. So it's a two-wheel enclosed scooter. And it's effectively sort of the visionary founder, Danny Kim, who's a Rhode Island School of Design grad, moved out to the West Coast to build the product, said, you know, if you start from scratch in the urban environment we live in, in Boston or in New York or in San Francisco, you wouldn't design the car as the car. you design these sort of small enclosed devices for urban travel. And so he decided he was going to build that. So the first thing he did was build a foam prototype. Foam. Because the hypothesis he was testing was form factor and sort of the consumer reaction to the form factor. The second prototype he built was cardboard. The third prototype he built was this big because he wanted to test the gyroscope because the gyroscope is really important that it doesn't tip over because it's only two wheels and the gyroscope is what stabilizes it. So he built to test that MVP, it was like this big. The final prototype he built, which was of sheet metal and had the gyroscope, was normal size. That whole process cost under a million dollars to build a, an auto company. Okay? So, these techniques are being used in hardware environments by very creative, very capable entrepreneurs. Uh, you all want to enjoy the rest of your evening. I'll let you go. 
keep the dialogue going online, be a part of this revolution, bring it to Boston, make Boston a great product management environment. Thank you very much.